Welcome to Inspiring People, the show about inspiring people, those who are inspired and those who inspire others. We all know them. They're good examples. They're supportive. They embrace life. They live inspiring lives in their day-to-day -day actions and, in turn, inspire others to do the same. Hi, welcome to Inspiring People. My name is Mary Otto, and today you're going to be seeing part two of an interview that I've been doing with Alex Dakota. So, welcome back to the show, Alex. Here Thank we go. Much. Okay, you. when we when we um, ended the first segment, you were talking about the teaching of the Ojibwe language and so on. So let's try to pick up um, at that point. How did you begin, or how do you begin teaching the language? Well, uh, it really began when I was about five years old. <laughs> and I would hear my grandparents uh, talk in Ojibwe and I just loved the Ojibwe language. It seemed so beautiful, it just flowed and it just calmed me. So I always tried to listen to them when they talked Ojibwe. And uh, I noticed though that they didn't always talk Ojibwe. So uh, one time I thought, I'm gonna ask my grandma to teach me Ojibwe. But then I asked her, first I asked her, I said, I said, how come you don't always talk Ojibwe? And she kind of got mad at me, and I got really scared because my grandma was really nice to me, and, and yeah, I didn't want to make her mad, you know. But she said, uh, when I was a little girl, she said, And she said, if, when I was in going to uh, Indian school, when I was a little girl, if we talked our language, we'd get licking, she said. Oh. So that's why she was sad, you know. Oh. So I didn't ask her then to teach me Ojibwe because I know it brought back bad memories, you know. Okay. But then I told myself, I told myself in English, of course, when I was small. I'm going to learn Ojibwe someday and nobody's going to stop me. Okay. So it really started when I was about five years old, you know, and um, of course it, I didn't have a lot of sources, you know, but I found those sources as I got older. I found elders in the community that learned that knew Ojibwe, mm -hmm. and also I found a lot of sources uh, from Minnesota here, which kind of is the leader uh, in uh, Ojibwe language revitalization. Oh, really? So I found a lot of sources here, you know, and our mm -hmm. people, uh, the Turtle Mountain Ojibwe, actually uh, it came from Minnesota. We're uh, a branch off of the, the Red Lake pillagers. Oh, okay. We ourselves are pillagers, too. You are, okay. And there are some pillagers that uh, live here in uh, White Earth. When they were making reservations, our people had split. Some came to White Earth and some mm -hmm. went to Turtle Mountain. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and our chiefs were Little Shell and um, Red Bear. Red pear, okay. But uh, so that's where it all started, and then the rest is just you know finding elders and asking mm -hmm. a lot of questions, mm -hmm. a lot of hard work. I'm sure. And uh, but uh, Minnesota has really uh, been a great uh, asset for me. The people that have done the language revitalization here, and uh, when I got my license to teach language, and they didn't have any job openings up at home and I found uh, an opportunity to come down here to teach, well then I was just glad mm -hmm. you know, that I had an opportunity to come down here and start teaching language, you know. And Do so you teach? I came down here to, uh, to uh, Detroit Lakes. Okay. Excuse me. Do you teach the written language then too, or do you, more? okay. And, and does that, how does that, it, the Ojibwe language when you speak it is a, is a beautiful it ha language and it has a lot of different tones, doesn't it, or, or different pitches and things like that. So then when you write it, is there a certain, is it the same kind of sentence structure you'd use to write in English and so on, or does no, it trans? It's, it's very different. In fact, we have our own uh, alphabet, but I don't use it because it's in uh, syllabics. Oh. You know, in the material I make for class, you know, I don't have you know, like a typewriter in syllabics or anything like mm -hmm. that. So we use the Ojibwe, I mean, we use the English alphabet. And uh, we have kind of formed it to fit our language, although it doesn't fit the language perfectly. We have formed a, a system called the double vowel system that is pretty much uh, used uh, throughout the United States and Canada as sort okay. of a, the official way to write Ojibwe with the English alphabet. Okay. Though it's not perfect, it's pretty consistent enough anyway to teach, and that's how I learned uh, a lot from there. 
You know, I learned a lot from uh, the Oshikabe West Native Journal, which was uh, published out of the University of Bemidji. And, uh, and there, uh, Dr. Anton Troer, he had, uh, who teaches uh, there at Bemidji, he had interviewed a lot of elders from uh, Minnesota, Wisconsin, Canada, and uh, put their stories out on, you know, it, with the double vowels. Sure, okay. In the book, with the English translation. So there, I learned a lot from, uh, that's where I learned most of my language from. Plus, I came with cassette tape so you can hear the pronunciation. Mm -hmm. So I really owe that. I don't think I would have ever learned Ojibwe if it wasn't for the Chicago West Native Journal and the work that uh, Dr. Anton Troy did there. And they're still doing at the university. They are. That's okay. what I say. They are the, like the leaders in the language okay. revitalization. Yeah. What's, a double, what's a double vowel? Wow. Well, Ojibwe has uh, uh, four double vowels. It's a long, it's sort of like a long vowel. A, E, U, and A. They're long vowels. So is that the they long? take a little bit longer to say. A, E, U, and A. And then there's three short vowels, which are a lot shorter when you say them. I, A, O. Oh, okay. They're, they're shorter. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it depends, it's, it has to do with the length that they're voiced. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. Long vowels and short vowels. Very interesting. Well, um, how about some of the um, people or events in your life that have influenced the choices you've made and your decisions to, for example, your decision to come back here and, and so on? Uh, probably, I would have to say the creator is probably the most influential person, decision maker in my life. When I started uh, learning about the culture and participating in ceremonies, probably the biggest change in my life came when I went on a vision quest. Vision quest. And we call that Gia Goshimowin. Okay. And when I went on a vision quest, I learned so much about uh, myself and uh, the Creator mm -hmm. and my purpose for being here. Mm -hmm. And I always try to influence our young people to go on Gia Goshimowin vision quest. And a long time ago, like the children are encouraged to do that a lot, so that they can strengthen their relationship with the Creator, with God. You know, and they would go and fast. Sometimes you know, four up to four days with no food and no water, and there's even been uh, you know stories of people fasting as much as up to eight and ten days. Oh, really? But you know, nowadays you know, and the world is way different. Mm -hmm. You know, and so um, I know if you try to, uh, some people say see that as uh, you know, if you try to encourage someone to do that now, they probably think you're trying to be abusive to them. You know. Oh, as sure. You know, mm -hmm. always thought you have to have your three square meals a day mm -hmm. and stuff mm -hmm. like that. So the world has really changed, and and how to get the children to learn the culture when the world is so different, it's kind of hard sometimes. You know, there's mm -hmm. a lot of obstacles besides just doing the culture. For instance, you know, getting people to go on vision quests. You know, mm -hmm. but when I was on a vision quest, the creator, uh, my, and it's not made. You know, vision quest wasn't just for you know righteous into adulthood like some people believe. It was. Vision Quest is used for whenever you need answers to problems. So you can go on Vision Quest anytime in your life. Mm -hmm. and, and it's good to do it often, you know. Like, and so I've done it more than that whenever you have problems. But, and, okay. Or you need answers from the Spirit. But the Creator told me, uh, you know, when I was on Vision Quest, you know, I had a choice whether to learn um, ceremonies or to, to go to college. This was back when I was in, uh, about 20 years old. Uh, no, about 26 years old. I decided to learn ceremonies. Oh, that very interesting. That was probably the biggest thing that changed my life. Okay. You know, I'm not saying that there's nothing wrong with college. Of mm -hmm. course, college is just as important. Mm -hmm. But I was uh, the old people. The people were old, and I, you know, and to have respect for them, I thought if I went to college first, they might not might be here when I get back. Sure, sure. So I learned from the elders, and I've never. Uh, I'm, I'm glad I. I made that choice because it uh, gave me a lot of things I use now in my life that I wouldn't have had sure. if I had gone the, you know, the other way oh, sure. and not learn from the elders. Well, and we're running out of time, but I just want to say um, that you have another big um, 
change coming in your life here pretty soon, don't you? I think we should mention it real quickly. Yeah, my first uh, baby we're expecting any day now. Okay, and so we want to congratulate you and your wife, Renita, on that. Um, we on also your new have three step I have three stepchildren. Three stepchildren, too. Well, great fun you're going to have. Thank you so much. How do you say thank you in Ojibwe? Miigwech. Miigwech. Thank you very much, Alex. Thank you. thank you all for joining us on Inspiring People.